so far uh, today's class we uh, i could cover the conceptual parts of the exercise i could not get into the hands on bits uh, but i saw that there are uh, codes that are available that we can look into and i thought that between the four of us we could uh, discuss some of the conceptual aspects of the exercises uh, so let's start with those uh, so the first exercise is uh, about best subset forward subset uh, forward stepwise and backward stepwise uh, selection on a single data set with uh, p predictors uh, and we know that uh, all of these models create uh, like p plus one uh, models with the extra model being the intercept so the first question is which of the three models with k predictors has the smallest training uh, rss and uh, we know that the best subset selection has uh, you know it fits or every possible combination of uh, all the predictors uh, so with, when a model fits so many uh, predictors uh, it increases the chances of finding models that uh, fit the training data very well so uh, we can conclude that uh, uh, that best subset selection would be the uh, way to go uh, when it comes to, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so best subset, subset selection would be the way to go when it comes to uh, lowest training RSS. Uh, let me also try to pull this up. Yeah, the next one is uh, which of these three models with K predictors has the smallest Test RSS. Uh, so the best test RSS would be can, can be provided by any model. We can't really predict. Uh, it would depend on the uh, data. Uh, and uh, yeah, while best subset selection is like fitting all the model, it has uh, very high, uh, very low bias and very high variance. Uh, forward and backward stepwise uh, models will be are more choosy, but they can also find uh, good fits uh, when it comes to the test data. So we can't really predict uh, which one of these three models have uh, will have the smallest test RSS. Uh, next, we have a couple of true and false statements. So uh, the first one is the predictors in a K variable model. Uh, in a forward stepwise uh, selection strategy uh, are a subset of the k plus one variable model. And we know that that's true because at every stage uh, forward step in, in forward stepwise selection, uh, every stage like adds one more variable than uh, there were in the previous model. So, so we know that k goes from zero through p uh in this particular example so we know that at every stage we we will have one more or one extra uh predictor than uh there were in the in the earlier model uh so k the k variable model will always be a subset of the k plus one variable model so that also that's true uh and then uh the next question is the predictors in the k k variable model identified by backward uh stepwise are a subset of the k plus one variable uh, model. And we also know that's true because uh, the while the direction might be different between forward and backward, uh, in backward selection model, the k plus one variable model will come before the k model. Uh, but uh, the k model will always remove one of the variables in the k from the k plus one variable model, which means that uh, the k variable model will always be a subset of the k plus one variable model. Uh, the third one is uh, predictors in the k variable model identified by backward stepwise are a subset of the predictors in the k plus one variable model identified by forward stepwise. Now this can be different. So and and this is false because uh, the variable selection in uh, between forward and backward are not related to each other. So, so, so the k variable model in a in a forward stepwise uh, model uh, may not be a subset of the k plus one variable in a in, in a forward stepwise model. 
Uh, and similarly, fourth is also false because uh, the opposite also holds true. So the k variable model in a forward stepwise may not may may not be a subset of the k plus one variable model in the backward stepwise selection strategy. Uh, the final one was uh, the predictors in the k variable model identified by best subset are a subset of the k plus one variable model identified by the best subset selection. And uh, that also does not seem to be true to me because uh, uh, at every stage, we might have a completely different set of predictors in the K model versus the K plus one model. So the best subset will not necessarily add just one more variable to the existing set of data at every stage. I think it, it selects an, a new sort of set of uh, uh, variables from the existing pools by choosing uh, K out of P predictors or K plus one out of P predictors. But I was not completely sure about this. What, what do you all think? I think that for using subset selection, sorry, best subset selection, even if we have, for example, two cases where we have the same number of predictors, uh, and the model, uh, it and the model, and both models perform uh, uh, as well. No, would uh, how do you say? Has uh, has has say a similar let's say predicting rate even in that case the we have the same number of predictors but the predictors can be different so and that's why i also agree with your with your answer awesome yeah i also thought so okay thank you uh that makes sense any other comments on uh questions in the first exercise Oh, all good. Awesome. Okay, so we move on to the second exercise now. So the second one was uh, in parts uh, A through C indicate which one of the following is correct. And uh, the question was, uh, the first one was uh, uh, lasso relative to least square. Uh, is it more flexible uh, and hence will give uh, improved prediction accuracy? uh or or uh, is it more flexible and it would give uh improved prediction accuracy when uh variance increases or is it less flexible uh, uh and and the same options uh, basically uh so we know that uh lasso is similar to the least uh squares except for the term that the lasso uses an additional parameter of uh, uh, lambda times mod uh, or absolute value of pj uh, and that makes it a less flexible model because it has it has like an additional penalty shrinkage factor that that it applies uh, to choose the values of or, or that it uses to minimize the values of beta uh, uh, or the vector for beta j and uh, so now uh, what we need to identify is, or what we need to clarify is whether the lasso uh, will have improved prediction accuracy when its uh, bias uh, increases less uh, than its decrease in bias or vice versa. Uh, so I felt that uh, when lambda increases, the flexibility of the fit decreases. So we, we saw that in both uh, lasso and registrations, especially in lasso when lambda increases, a lot of coefficients were being pushed to zero. Uh, uh, so this will mean that with increasing values of lambda, there will be a substantial decrease in the variance of the predictors. Uh, and uh, the bias will not increase as much uh, because it's still a linear model. Uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it is not, uh, moving up, I mean, linear models in, in any ways will have pretty low low bias, uh, a very low bias. Um, sorry, make your pardon. Uh, linear models in any ways have a very high bias, 
and this still remains a linear model uh, with an increased shrinkage parameter. So the bias will not increase too much uh, as compared to a least square model, uh, but with an increasing value of lambda, uh, the variance can de decrease substantially because we are, with an increasing value in lambda, we are shrinking a lot of factors towards zero. Uh, and uh, in case, of, especially in case of lasso, uh, a lot of coefficients will actually become zero. Uh, so I feel that uh, uh, that the third option is the best, where uh, we know that it's a less it's a less flexible model, uh, and the prediction accuracy will increase uh, when uh, its uh, increase in bias is less than its decrease in uh, variance. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks, Vivek. Uh, all right. So the next one is uh, to uh, is to repeat uh, this same idea for ridge regression. And I think the with the ridge regression, the concept remains the same. Uh, ridge regression would be less flexible than uh, the least squares regression. Uh, the only difference would be that uh, in ridge uh, we are not shrinking anything exactly to zero but we are shrinking coefficients towards zero nonetheless and uh, yeah it, it the bias would not increase substantially as compared to a least square model uh, but with increasing penalty uh, shrinkage uh, we will see a lot of decrease in the variance so uh, the, the, the option remains the same uh, the last one is interesting the last one says repeat the same idea uh, but for non-linear methods uh, as compared to least squares. Now, this is, this is interesting because we know that all non-linear methods will have uh, a higher, uh, are much more flexible than least squares. Uh, so we, we are looking for something between options one and two. Uh, but, uh, and we also know that uh, with increasing non-linearity, the variance will also increase, but the bias decreases uh, uh, sharply uh, when we move from linear to non-linear models. Uh, so I again think that option two is uh, better here. So it, so the model is more flexible, and the prediction accuracy will increase when there is an increase in the variance. When the increase in variance is less than the decrease uh, in bias. Uh, so yeah. So that's that's the. So that's that's. The choice, I think, uh, for non-linear. Uh, with that, we can move to the third uh, exercise. Uh, sorry, uh, one question. Yes. Yes. Uh, in in that in that same sort of comparison, uh, do we know if if reach is more or less flexible than lasso regression? Mm, that's a great idea. Uh, let me think. So. For la so the only difference between lasso and ridge is that they are uh, in lasso a lot of coefficients will actually be shrunk to zero. So I think that the decrease in variance for lasso would be sharper than the decrease in variance for ridge, uh, with a uh, with a slight increase in bias in both. So I think lasso should be more, yeah, should have a should be relatively more flexible than, uh, no, sorry, ridge should be more flexible, but the decrease in variance for uh, lasso would be higher. Does, does that make sense? What, what do you all think? Uh, so, so, the, so because uh, for lasso, uh, the coefficients didn't quite reach zero, but for ridge, they do. Uh, that yeah. provides a uh, rich um, more or less flexibility. I, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, so I, I thought that, so I think that uh, for lasso, uh, the decrease in variance would be higher as compared to ridge because uh, a lot of coefficients are actually being turned to zero. Um, okay, okay, thank you. 
yeah but i'm not sure do other people have any uh, inputs on that I'm... yeah nasa should be less flexible now wish yeah yeah nasa should be less flexible now uh, because it it's forcing more components more coefficients to be given okay but that's a interesting question thank you lucio uh, i will think more about that I, and I think they do discuss. I'm forgetting the discussion between Lasso versus Fridge. Maybe we, we need to go back to that one uh, uh, to see how uh, Lasso performs against Fridge. All right. Uh, so yeah, with that, if there are no more questions, we can move to the third exercise. So the third one was uh, that. Uh, so, so we are given uh, uh, an equation, and we are, so suppose this uh, we estimate the regression coefficients in a linear regression model by minimizing this parameter, uh, where the subject is that ab the absolute value of beta j's should be lesser than or equal to a value of x, uh, and then s can, and then the question is that if s increases from zero, what will happen to the training RSS? Uh, so we see that. Uh, when s is absolutely equal to zero, then uh, beta j would be zero. Uh, but when s increases, uh, the constraint on beta j decreases. So beta j can take like higher values if s increases. Uh, now, when beta j increases, uh, this whole term would decrease. And it would be like a steady decrease. So higher the beta j, lower would be the uh, would be the net uh, sort of term um yeah so i think it would decrease steadily uh, the 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 training rss i think should dec decrease steadily uh, when we move when we increase s from zero does that make sense Yes. Okay. Thank you, Lucio. Uh, and then uh, the next part is what will happen to the yeah what will now happen to the test RSS? So same idea, uh, but what happens to the test RSS? So I think for the test RSS, uh, it would again see a similar. Uh, Sort of decrease as we saw in the training RSS, uh, but then it will see it will uh, reach a minimum value when beta is equal to zero, uh, and then it would sort of in see, see uh, an, in a, a U sort of a curve which we saw in a lot of other graphs throughout the chapter as well. Uh, so if, so I think that beta would in decrease uh, first. Uh, as uh, and it sort of follow the same uh, trajectory as training RSS, uh, but then it would start increasing as, as some of the other graphs uh, had shown us. I'm trying to think if we have uh, an image here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what What do you all think? All right. So let's park that there, and then move to the next bits of the question, which is you know same same idea. What is going to happen to the variance, uh, the squared bias, and uh, irreducible error. Uh, so we see that uh, here again, going back to this equation, when S increases uh, from zero, uh, the variance, of course, will uh, decrease steadily uh, as uh, the constraint on S is being reduced. So beta will beta J will take higher values uh, over time, and if beta J keeps on increasing, uh, variance for the overall uh, model will will decrease steadily. Uh, now, when variance decrease steadily, we know that the squared bias will also 
uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that the, that the variance will increase uh, steadily because beta j uh, is increasingly taking higher values. So this, uh, so the so the variance will uh, increase steadily, and when variance increase increases steadily, the bias would sort of decrease because uh, of the uh, variance bias uh, trade off. Uh, bias variance trade off, and then finally we know that uh, the irreducible irreducible error has nothing to do with uh, beta j or this uh, factor right here. So the uh, so the irreducible error uh, will remain constant over time, uh, or over over different values of x. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, so that was question three. Any uh, any comments or any thoughts here? Uh, when we consider in that question that the bound for the absolute value of the beta coefficients was given via the absolute value, uh, if we, instead of using absolute value, use something like just a square, uh, still the, the conclusion could be the same, right? A slightly different. That's exactly the next question. So, are, are you thinking about something like this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that that was the next question, and and the, I think that the conclusions change a little bit. Uh, so here, what is happening is, uh, so when lambda, so what they're trying to do is, uh, they have this squared value of the uh, coefficient beta j. Uh, and uh, they have another like shrinkage uh, factor lambda. Uh, and uh, when we increase the value of lambda from zero onwards, uh, what happens is that the constraint increases. So the con so the uh, when lambda increases, the constraint on the on beta j increases because we are trying to minimize this whole term. And uh, when and this is very similar to the idea of uh, ridge regression where we are seeing that when we have uh, increasing values of lambda our coefficients are approaching almost towards zero um, and for very lab, very very uh, higher values it would be very very close to zero so the training rss in this case so instead of decreasing steadily it will increase uh, steadily uh, uh, sorry, only one comment. Uh -huh. uh, I see a bit different, a bit different in in the current exercise. What I meant is that if the formula was like like the previous one, oh. but but no lambda term, just uh, only that bound being calculated via the square of the beta coefficients. But still, the conclusion would be the same, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 If there is no lambda term and there is a boundary condition. Uh, with a squared value, yeah, I th I think the yeah, I I think that the conclusions should remain the same in that case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because with increasing values of s, the I mean the constraint on beta j would keep on increasing. So when s becomes higher, the beta j square can would keep on keep on to be higher. So yeah, I think it should remain the same. Sorry, I misunderstood your earlier question. I thought. We were thinking about like adding a lambda graph. Um, but yeah, so when we do have a lambda, then I think the training uh, error or the training RSS would steadily increase uh, because it is adding that uh, extra constraint on beta. Uh, similarly, the test RSS would first uh, uh, decrease and then in, increase in a U shape as we were seeing, uh, as we have seen in the ridge uh, regression example. Uh, because we know that when lambda, the value of lambda increases, the flex, the the model becomes less flexible. So reducing the which which essentially results in reducing the variance of uh, the prediction and the increase in bias is not as much. So as lambda increases beyond an ideal point, we again see that okay, this is uh, the the errors are increasing, and it, it follows that U shape that we have seen throughout the 
book and uh, yeah as far as variance and bias is considered uh, we know that when lambda is increasing variance would decrease because it is pushing a lot of coefficients towards zero uh, when variance is reducing uh, we will we know that the bias will still be increase and uh, the uh, irreducible error will remain constant because that is not by any uh, so so that was that i have not could not attempt uh, question 5 uh, if any of you have a solution to question 5 that would be i would be interested to learn more about that and we can like chat about that later uh, but i wanted to move to the last question i have also not done the bayesian question so, I, so the last one that i wanted to discuss was the uh was question 6 uh so exercise 6 uh says that uh, consider 6.12 which is this equation uh and uh consider that p is 1 uh and for some choice of y1 and lambda is 0 plot uh this equation as a function of beta 1 and uh in a way that uh, our plot confirms that 6.12 is solved by 6.14 uh which is uh, uh beta j uh, is equal to yj over 1 plus lambda so we start with a single value of y let's say 10 and we have a sequence of betas ranging from negative 10 to positive 10 and we consider lambda as 5 and we generate this equation so after that we estimate the minimum beta as uh, i mean based on equation 6.14 so y over 1 plus lambda and we estimate the value using this estimated beta and plot this estimated value uh and the estimated beta both uh alongside the minimum uh values obtained in equation 1 and we see that uh uh all of these points basically coincide so when y, so when we are considering y is equal to 10 uh and lambda equal to 5 uh beta is uh, the beta given by equation 6.14 which is uh, 10 over 1 plus 5 uh is equals 1.67 and that minimizes the ridge regression equation and we also see that uh, uh uh this is like this, this is the minimum point and this point sort of uh, coincides with both of uh, uh, as as obtained by the minimum value of uh, the equation as well as the estimate obtained from the equation 6.14 that was given so this proves that aspect and uh lastly we have uh Uh, equation 6.13 and equation 6.15 uh 6.0 so equation 6.13 is uh, let me go back to that book uh so yeah this is equation 6.13 and which is the equation for lasso and this is the equation for 6.15 uh where uh beta j Uh, take the form of uh, yj minus lambda by 2 when yj is greater than lambda by 2 it takes the form of yj plus lambda by 2 when when yj is less than negative lambda by 2 and it's zero when uh, the absolute value of yj is less than equal to lambda by 2 so the question remains the same uh, we just have to prove that uh, for some value of y1 and uh, lambda uh, the plot uh, should show that 6.13 is confirmed by 6.15 uh so we use a similar approach uh we keep the same values for lambda and y uh and uh, we know that 
the uh, equation uh, is given as uh, y minus beta square plus lambda times absolute beta and the minimum beta estimated using 6.15 would be y minus lambda by 2 uh, because lambda is positive. Uh, we feed this value into uh, the equation and then we plot it uh, and we see that uh, the minimum value for the graph is at 7.5 uh, which uh, is also shown by uh, the, the equation 6.5 one five, which also shows that seven seven point five minimizes the maximum last. So yeah, so that's it. I saw a solution for exercise seven, uh, but I did not have I do not have enough background in Bayesian statistics, so I uh, could not sort of get a grip on that. If either of you have uh, uh, gone through this exercise or have any comments uh, on this, we can talk about that. If not, we can, we can maybe wrap up for today and uh, connect over a chat or anything if we have like other solutions or if we find something. For the rest of the questions. Yeah, well, I, I didn't cover that exercise. Okay. Sure. Cool. No worries. I'll try. To, yeah, I I need to get a better hang of the posterior distributions. Uh, I'm starting to learn. I yeah, I've, I've been wanting to learn more about Bayesian ideas. Uh, but yeah, I need to spend some more time into that. No further thoughts from me, but I do want to thank you for spending a lot of time thinking about all these conceptual matters as well. Thank you, Derek. Uh, that means a lot. Uh, great. So if we don't have anything else, we can uh, maybe wrap up for today. And uh, I'm very excited that from next week onwards, we are moving to the nonlinear methods. Uh, so yeah, look forward to that. Okay, also about that particular exercise, I think in that in the probability for the science cohort, we covered a certain connection, no, so not connection, but generalization of the lasso and rich regression methods. Uh, I'm not sure if that was also in the chapter where we work with some Bayesian tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was chapter five, but okay. I, I, I don't know, I will try to, to look at the, the video. Uh, and okay. and send it in the chat because it, it it does show that there is there is a generalization for rich uh, and lasso if you consider another perspective of estimating uh, well for estimation so I, I will try to look at the video. Got it. That would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I I'll also try to read up. I, I yeah, my vision ideas are really weak, uh, so I need to learn uh, more on those. Uh, Okay, so okay. just yeah. to finish up uh, uh -huh. for the next chapter, well, Derek, uh, thank you for having signed up already. So we will be covering moving beyond the linearity, chapter seven next week. Yeah. So thank you again uh, for presenting and we'll see you all in a week. Okay, yeah. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. See you next week. Bye.